Hello and welcome. I'm Esther Allen, a translator from Spanish and French and professor at City University of New York. And I'm here with Alison Markin Powell, who translates Japanese literature, works with the PEN America Translation Committee, and has been a driving force behind the conference that we are launching today. Thank you for joining us for the launch of our new weekly series for Translating the Future, which commemorates the first international conference on literary translation held in the United States, the World of Translation, which was convened by the Pan American Center and the Translation Committee and took place exactly 50 years ago this week in New York City, our beloved wounded New York. We began planning this anniversary conference over two years ago, never ever imagining that circumstances would force us to transform what was to be a landmark in-person gathering and celebration um, and to reconceive it in the virtual space. Happily, the medium that we're all on now provides new opportunities unbound by location or time zone. We're excited to kick off with a conversation between two renowned translators and scholars, David Bellos and Karen Emmerich. David is the former and Karen the current director of Princeton University's Program in Translation and Intercultural Communication. They'll be talking about what has changed and what hasn't in the world of literary translation over the past 50 years. David has written and translated a number of books, including the best-selling, is that a fish in your ear? Translation and the Meaning of Everything. Karen's most recent book is Literary Translation and the Making of Originals. You can read their full bios on the Center for the Humanities website. The series of weekly one hour conversations we're launching today will continue throughout the summer and into the fall. Still, translating the future will be anchored to its originally planned dates in late September when several marquee events will take place, including the symposium a Flight of Tokarczuk Translators, featuring several of Nobel laureate Olga Tokarczuk's translators into various languages, English, Japanese, and Hindi, among others. We'll be here every Tuesday until then, and perhaps even beyond, having some of the most engaging and compelling conversations about the past, present, and future of literary translation and its place in the world where we now find ourselves. Please join us next Tuesday at 1.30 for Translating the Uncertain Present, a conversation between Madhu Kaza and Lina Munzer, who will be joining us from Beirut. And please keep coming back every week. Check the Center for the Humanities site for updated event listings. Today's conversation will be followed by a Q&A. Please email your questions for David Bellows and Karen Emmerich to translatingthefuture2020 at gmail.com. If you know anyone who was unable to join us for the live stream, a recording will be uploaded soon to the HowlRound and Center for the Humanities sites. Before we turn it over to David and Karen, we'd like to offer our sincere gratitude to our partners at the Center for the Humanities at the Graduate Center CUNY, to Frank Henschker, director of the Martin E. Siegel Theater Center, to the Coleman Center for Scholars and Writers at the New York Public Library, and to PEN America. And now here are a few words from Chip Raleigh, PEN America's Senior Director of Literary Programs and World Voices Festival. Hello, thanks so much, Allison. Thanks so much, Esther. It's an enormous privilege um, and honor to be asked to speak here today. Um, translation, as you know, plays a huge role in the work of PEN. It was, after all, a translation prize that saw the beginning of the PEN Literary Awards over 50 years ago. These, those are awards that have grown to include over 20 other categories and that bestow way over $300,000 a year. And of course, translation itself is in the DNA of the World Voices Festival. I remember very, very well, I can't remember the year, but I remember very, very well meeting Esther Allen so many years ago now, it must be over 10, maybe almost 15 years ago now, at an international pen meeting. It might have been in Bled, Slovenia, or some, it was in some European hamlet where we were having some meeting about something or other. I don't, it might have been a Congress uh, where we gathered together. And at the time I was with um, Sydney Pen in, in Australia. And I remember very well hearing Esther talk about the enormous, the really important work that Pen America was doing at that time to try to address 
what we've all become familiar with, which is the low percentage of books um, that are published in the United States that are works that are translated from other languages. And one of the things that she mentioned that she was most proud of at the time was of course the World Voices Festival. And Esther was one of the founders of the World Voices Festival along with Salman Rushdie, Mike Roberts and others at PEN America at the time. So it is quite literally the case that we would not have a World Voices Festival without the enthusiasm and support of people like Esther, without the translation committee, without the translators who translate all the works upon which the festival was predicated and the works that the festival um, shares every year. Like the translation conference plans, our plans for the festival this year had the rug pulled out from under them from by this you know, very strange occurrence that we're all experiencing this um, coronavirus pandemic. We had to cancel, we were to have our festival this past week and we canceled it uh, probably about, I think it was in mid-March, we had to make that decision to cancel it. And it meant about 150 riders who were due to appear in New York wouldn't be coming to see us. And so in its stead, we pivoted to launch a stream of content, which we launched last week during the week that the festival was supposed to take place. And we'll be rolling out content from, from then until probably until the end of June. So we've got a whole lot of things lined up, including podcasts, interviews, videos, and we're most um, extraordinarily proud to be associated with this series of events that will be leading up to the 50th, 50th anniversary conference of the Translation Conference which of course Penn was an organization that had established so that had um, hosted so many years ago today. So I, I wish you all a great first meeting of this conference. I believe it is 50 years to the day um, since that conference took place all those many years ago. I wish you great success with the Translating the Future programs. I'm looking forward to this discussion today with Karen and David, and I'm looking forward to all the discussions that continue weekly um, way on into September, however long you want to keep going. Um, it's just a fantastic effort that you're making, and I'm enormously proud to be associated with it, as we all are at PEN America. So, bon voyage, and on to Karen and David. Well, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you so much. Uh, uh, Esther especially and the vast team behind you for inspiring and um, organizing uh, and getting this project going. Uh, you've done so many things like this in the past so I'm not surprised but I'm still immensely grateful for your energy and uh, ability to get people to do things. So um, we're here Karen and I uh, to talk about well translation over the last 50 years, starting with this extraordinary conference that took place on May the 12th, 1970. Now, I mean, in the world before the virus conferences, well, there were 10 a penny. I mean, we've all been to all sorts of conferences where we have made friends and networked and done various mildly useful things, but actually not learned very much. But I think the pen world in translation World of Translation Conference of 50 years ago was a real exception to that routine. I mean, it was a, it was a blessing without shadow, without blemish. It seems to have been a triumph <clears throat> and to have had long running and very beneficial consequences. And that really isn't true of many uh, such gatherings. It was quite extraordinary. Um, and I think uh, just to measure the uh, impact uh, that, that it's had, um, I would like us to listen to uh, Isaac Bashevis Singer, who addressed the conference then uh, in his imitable, inimitable accent and said some things that, well, actually, when you think about it, are quite extraordinary. If we could hear that clip, Travis. Translation must become not, not only an honorable profession, but an art. While I don't like bloody revolutions, I would love to see a translator's revolution. Translators are the ones who really should be liberated. In all of literature, they have been the pariahs, suffering the scorn of the critics and seldom hearing a good word. When the book was good, the author got all the credit and the translator nothing. When the book was bad, 
the blame was on the translator. Let this conference be the beginning of a rebellion where ink will, instead of blood will be shed. Many a prophet has... Thank you. Um, isn't that wonderful? A rebellion, a revolt in which uh, ink but not blood will be shed. <clears throat> um, to some considerable degree, that revolution, bloodless revolution, has sort of happened. And I'm sure uh, Karen is going to talk more about all that has changed. But to begin with, I'd like to point out that uh, based on the papers and the recordings of that conference that we've had access to, um, an awful lot of things uh, actually haven't changed and are still the same. I mean, the conference drew together writers talking about their translators, translators talking about their writers, uh, people opinionating, or actually doing more than opinionating, about the differences between translating into English and translating into other languages, notably uh, Russian and Polish and French in, in these papers, um, and then publishers talking about, well, why they are the way they are. Um, <clears throat> and I think um, that's where least has changed. Uh, as the various publishers who contributed to the conference pointed out in 1970, and as I guess any publisher could point out today, an insolvent publisher is not much use to a translator or an author. Uh, they do have to somehow survive financially and translations are not a very <coughs> good way, not a reliable way, um, uh, to put it mildly, of earning money. And so that financial pressures continue to weigh on um, the speed and uh, quality and rate um, and range of what is brought from other languages into English, especially through the United States, but also through Britain. I mean, a number of things have changed. In 1970, there was still a kind of war of rights between Britain and America as to who got to commission the translators and claims are made that the British underpay their translators. I'm sure they did actually. Um, <coughs> and also there were different arrangements for translators rights in the UK and the US. These have largely been overcome and the situation is very much more fluid between the two um, English language domains now than it was then. Um, and also publishers have slowly, um, but actually genuinely given more recognition to translators on title pages and catalog credits and so forth. So some of those things have been achieved. But the general picture, the publishing translations is a pretty difficult business um, and the translators mustn't expect too much from their publishers remains the same. Do you think that's true, Karen? I feel like I need to be the voice of revolution here. <laughs> um, and it's so one of the things that is um, so remarkable about so there's the, the, the recordings we've been given access to for the entire, you know, week long conference was really amazing to hear some of those voices and then the papers have been published collectively, including I'm, you know, I'm not saying this for you, for you, David, but for all of those who are listening who might not know, of course. Um, there's a manifesto on translation that was written up at the same time that is published. Um, and one, there is a phrase, in fact, um, that that mention, that posits translators as the proletarians of literature with nothing to lose but their chains. Um, and it, one of the things that's really remarkable to me about reading over this material is this sense of, um, uh, which I think many translators now might feel sort of, um, um, hesitant to make these kinds of claims for a, you know, translators' rights for the for themselves, as opposed to a sort of more um, an ethical turn, I guess, in in recent years or in recent decades, even to thinking about um, translation as a form, as a as a mode of representation, in some sense, that you are you're fighting for your rights so that you're fighting for someone else as well, in some sense, um, but. I think when I was reading over the manifesto, there are all of these demands that are being made that are quite sort of explicit demands. Um, we need an index of translation similar to the annual books in print 
um, we have that now, you know, we have the 3% translation database. Um, prizes, a call for pri regional prizes um, for translations from the literatures of Asia, Latin America, France, Germany, Italy, Spain, and Scandinavia. Um, and it's amazing what gets le left off of that list, first of all. Um, but it's, it's also amazing to see that almost every sort of demand in the manifesto has now been met. Um, contact with publishers, the rise of sort of small presses um, who were publishing mostly or, or exclusively literature and translation. Um, professors, professorships of translation is another uh, manifesto point. Um, although trans, I'm going to read a little chunk from this because it's really fascinating to me, and then we'll return to this issue of publishers. But um, although translations have been made since the beginning of recorded history, and many of the best minds have been engaged in this appallingly difficult task, no chair of translation has ever been established. This is a shocking state of affairs, which should be remedied as soon as possible. Such professorships should properly be established in all the major universities. Um, so that again, you know, to, to echo David, your, well, everything is the same and nothing is the same, um, has not happened. We do not have professorships at all the major universities, uh, not by half or quarter, though other parts of the world are doing a bit better, um, I would say. But the real, the real um, sticking point that I think you're pointing to is this issue of, um, of, this notion that there's a pie, right? Um, and that translators and authors and publishers are all either working together or working against one another for um, a sort of finite amount of stuff that has to be shared. And that's something that I find um, is not necessarily the, the tone of the conversation now, uh, that there can be that, um, for the proletarians of literature with nothing, nothing to lose but their chains to rise up as translators, um, there is a lot more sort of flexibility and fluidity between who is a writer and a translator and a publisher and people are all of those things and booksellers, right? There are so many people who are working together um, to, ride, to sort of raise the, 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 um, uh, the way that translation is thought about in the world, not to mention readers and reviewers and you know professors as well. So I don't yes. know if that. All, all that's very true. Um, I mean, over the last 50 years, of course, there has been a huge concentration in the major publishing houses. Uh, in 1970, there were still many um, uh, uh, modestly sized independent publishers who've almost all now been gobbled up by the big groups. And the proliferation of really small houses, often non-profits, often specializing in translation, is like kind of the other side of that coin of the concentration. Um, but those small houses that do a lot of translating uh, now in the US and the UK uh, are always on, on, the, on the very brink of financial viability. And um, interesting, one thing you didn't mention is that the manifesto and several of the papers uh, call for government subsidies for mm -hmm. uh, uh, public money to support translation. <clears throat> and that has been forthcoming over the last 50 years from, um, uh, not from everywhere, but from a quite remarkable number of countries, um, the Scandinavians, the Dutch, uh, the Germans, now the Russians also, the Turks they, and the Koreans all have their own uh, funding to foster literary translation and to help to get works written in those languages into the international circuit or the international conversation of literature, primarily through subsidizing their translation initially into English, because English remains the, um, the real stumbling block, the real, the real limiting factor in that international circulation. Um, one thing that's quite interesting uh, in a couple of the publishers' contributions, and we're going to forget about the publishers in a minute, but I do just want to say this because it is partly the measure of the distance we have traveled in 50 years, not just in translation, but in, in history, in the world, is how much the scouting for selection of uh, commissioning of um, translations from other languages happened through specific individuals in publishing houses. Uh, people with international connections, 
and in 1970, people with international backgrounds. Um, uh, the great figures of commissioning editors in the major American and British houses in those days were nearly all people who'd emigrated to the English speaking world from somewhere else because of the course of world history, the Russian Revolution, the Second World War and so forth. That's, that generation has now disappeared, but it was their choices of those individuals who try to bring their cultures into English who had a lasting and marked effect. Nowadays, I think, <clears throat> um, obviously there are still many people with international backgrounds in publishing, but it's not quite the same cohort of emigres that uh, are key players in the uh, selection of international literature that, that gets through to us. Um, there are people more like you and me who just learn languages at school and, um, uh, and who are in those sorts of positions because of education and taste and passion and so forth. So I think there has been a big change there. Um, but the giants of the publishing of the post-war era that speak in um, the uh, conference in 1970, they really are almost mythical figures now uh, from Irving Howe to Singer to Rabassa and so forth. Um, they're quite, it's quite a remarkable collection of people. No, it really is. Um, and when I was, again, the sort of magic of getting to hear some of those voices as well. Um, and I wonder, maybe we should just play that um, Rabasa. I don't yeah. know if Travis can, we should just bring it in and at least we can hear, you know, since you just mentioned his name, maybe we can fold that in as well. Um, Ear is important in translation because it really lies at the base of all good writing. Writing is not truly a substitute for thought. It's a substitute for sound. We couch our thoughts in a language which is spoken, else we would have to resort to the formulas of mathematical science, which are the true substitutes for thought, with a beauty of their own, and which offer little in the way of oral feeling, except in rare cases such as that of the remarkable Google. So that when a person writes, he is speaking, and when a person reads, he is listening. Writing has drifted away from this idea of direct expression because it has the advantage of being outside the inexorable flow of time. It's a flow which can be halted, reversed, and emended. Nevertheless, what we appreciate in writing is much the same as what we look for in rhetoric, although that poor word has suffered at late, of late. First, it meant freshman English, and now it uh, means intentionally hollow statements. Sound, whether heard or imagined. Sound, which can either enhance or detract from the meaning. The translator with a tin ear is as deadly as a tone-deaf musician. It's really remarkable. So um, Esther had sent us this. Uh, snippet also to think about this, the first perhaps uh, appearance of the word Google, <laughs> uh, historically speaking, um, in this kind of context. But it's also amazing, like listening to this and reading that piece um, made me think of how, again, how much has changed in terms of sensitivity to um, all kinds of things, including like, is, is writing really a substitute for sound for people who don't have access to sound, <laughs> for instance, and those access issues. Um, and so many of the things that this 1970 collection doesn't touch on, um, issues of gender were ever present for me when I was reading and realizing how few women <laughs> there were in the collection. I think it's about 20% maybe. Um, uh, issues of ethics again, um, theory, you know, this is a moment before um, Steiner, before um, Susan Bassnett, before Gideon Torrey, before uh, Larry Venuti, who is one of the people who would have made, again, this sort of call to action on the part of translators turned it into something that is actually about, um, about uh, thinking of the translator uh, not exactly as a conduit for something from elsewhere, but thinking um, uh, more in terms, less in terms of aesthetics and more in terms of um, the responsibility uh, to to represent, uh, and then also the 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 responsibility or the or the right to not be representative um, is a thing that I've been thinking about a lot. Just uh, David, you were there with the conversation with. Um, Josh Freeman, who translates Uyghur poetry, uh, and 
making the claim that, well, why should Uyghur poetry have to be foot, heavily annotated and footnoted and uh, brought across as something anthropological as opposed to um, having the right to stand on the same aesthetic ground as other, as other um, poetries. And so that's, you know, what you were talking about, these sort of great figures of post-war publishing in the US. And um, it's curious also to see both the, the really expansive um, canon of works that they're talking about, but also the quite uh, sort of exclusive nature of some of the conversations that are being had. Uh, and so that makes me feel really great about being here 50 years later when we have so many more uh, things on the table, I think. Yes, we do have more on the table. And uh, some of the things said in 1970 and some of the people saying them are not perhaps as crystal clear or as straightforward as they might seem. Um, uh, uh, Clara Malraux, the uh, former wife of the French Minister of uh, Culture, uh, it gives a paper in, in, in that conference, and it's, it's printed in the volume uh, called uh, Translation and Complicity, in which she uh, pushes the line very strongly that to be a good translator, you must somehow be in cahoots with your author, that there must be this kind of um, uh, close, uh, almost symbiotic relationship between uh, a source and target, between uh, author and translator that is, uh, well, from some points of view, almost cloying and very excluding um, of translators who happen not to know the authors of their texts or indeed to be translating them, not because they are uh, um, in love with them, but uh, are actually interested in producing something worthwhile in English. I don't know how you felt about that issue of complicity because, you know, it's, it, it's always a great privilege to be able to work with a living author. But the idea of complicity somehow, um, I, I, I feel a little um, uneasy about. Yeah, and I mean, this is, you know, it's also coded as simpatico by some, you know, it's there, there are many ways of thinking about that. And for me, again, the sort of aesthetic focus um, on also on great works of literature is another thing that sort of goes throughout the conference. The assumption being that there are certain works that are worth translating and other, other works that are not worth translating. Um, and I think that, you know, currently um, both the idea of complicity and the idea of perhaps, um, you know, foreign literature being something that's going to make us better, smarter, brighter, more cultured, uh, cosmopolitan people isn't necessarily um, like there, you can think about uh, literature and translation being there for all kinds of reasons and to learn, I translate things, you know, um, that I think are reprehensible <laughs> sometimes to give to my students because I think that those are voices that we need to know are out there. Um, and so that too, I think the idea of complicity um, feels like it's aligning itself with a certain kind of discussion of, of masterpiece in a way yeah. that, um, <clears throat> Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, from my from my marginal experience of the world, I think um, those publishers that still do publish translations are still very much in the um, masterwork frame of mind that they, they they want to be reassured before they commission a translation that what they're translating is really important and worth doing, um, uh, and and it it, it, um, it derives from the same uh, mentality, the same mental framework as we see in the 1970 conference. Effectively, these are people who are making selections and wish wish to have prestige attributed to them for making that selection. Um, and I think it will be a long time before we're out of that particular mindset. It's a very well entrenched one, and that that's why I say you know not that much has changed there. But, or, or lots of other things have changed, especially just simply the way we talk. It's really interesting for people who are translators, writers, linguists to look back at this 1970 conference and see how people express themselves. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Ravasa mentioned the word rhetoric. Well, there is a rhetoric of speechifying that we don't use anymore. I'm not sure we're any better, but uh, um, uh, rhetoric that's out of use always looks a little bit funny. 
Um, um, yep. Um, I would also, can I just insert also one, um, because I feel like I've been saying th things that may sound sort of critical, like, oh, well, this wasn't happening, that wasn't happening. And um, of course it wasn't happening, you know? It had, that 1970 conference had to happen so that other uh, conversations could take, you know, it's more a celebration of all of the things that, that we're now talking about and thinking about and people who are being brought into the conversation and different kinds of um, voices and genres and um, high and low and, you know, all the rest. And I think it's just um, good to note that a lot of the sort of ensuing activism that has happened also is something that we we rose to the call for action <laughs> in a sense and all of the reading series and you know various ventures and all of the small publishers that resisted being you know if if big fish are eating the little fish then we need more minnows to turn into little fish right so that happened as well uh, and i think that this ongoing sort of proliferation of, of, you know, the reason we need the 50th anniversary uh, conference is not just to say, you know, um, not just as a corrective or to say, wasn't it great that we did this when, but to celebrate just the wealth of stuff that's happening and has been happening for the past five decades. I think um, maybe one of the most important ways in which we can both celebrate and reduplicate um, the 1970 conference is this. I do believe that it was the first time a large number of people involved in translating got together to talk to each other. Um, uh, as we all know, I mean, translating is essentially a fairly solitary uh, activity and translators have no special reason for meeting each other in the course of their business. Of it's a very pandemic proof thing to do, actually. <laughs> Sorry. Um, uh, but uh, since that conference, there have been more conferences, there have been more organizations, there have been more get-togethers, and a real um, a conversation, or a whole world of conversations between translators about translating have sprung up, flourished, multiplied, and created not only translation studies and academic discipline, but how we want, might call almost um, a, a, a translation culture. Um, of translators talking about translation. And that's a tremendous thing that's been uh, enlightening to me and also immensely supportive. It's also something that is called for in the manifesto. <laughs> There's a section on, you know, we need a translators conferences and the Alta being founded in 1978, I believe, you know, it's within a decade of this conference and uh, having yearly conferences. I think we're at number 43 now is the upcoming one. Um, and also, I just wanted to know, you know, this, it's, a, it's an um, American, a US centric conversation that we're having, but there's the sort of parallel um, growth of translation studies as a discipline that happens also coming out of the conferences, the Lubin conference that happened in 1978 and, um, and parallel conversations that are much more, you know, the sort of academic side is quite different in the UK and the US, I think. And the connections between the two fields are not always as sort of seamless as, as we might like. Um, but I think it's interesting to note um, the growth, the sort of simultaneous growth in different parts of the world. And again, that's only Anglo centric. And I think one of the things that uh, we, if I can quote just for a second from Susan Bassnett and David Johnston, who, who are writing about the, the growth of the field in the UK and in, in the EU. Um, hmm. There's something of a, uh, of a cultural contradiction here too, in that despite the comparatively low percentage of texts that are translated into English, there should be so much written in that recalcitrant language about translation as a practice. So that's another thing, you know, one of the things that I'm really excited to see in the next stage of our journey as a translation, as a community of translators is more translation of texts about translation from all kinds of languages in, into English and into one another. But for us, you know, who, who are operating in this field and teaching in this field too, that's something that I really uh, hope, hope that hope will become central. What has been lost, of course, since 1970, and that lurks in the background mostly, but on one occasion in the foreground of that 1970 conference, is the USSR. 
Yes. Yeah, this is a huge change in the world uh, for the people who were there um, and the people who lived those years. Because the USSR, amongst other things, was a great translating place. Um, it a, was a, a country, a state of over a hundred languages uh, with lots of um, reciprocal translations between them, dominated of course by Russia, but with a huge culture of translation of its own. Um, and uh, the paper by um, uh, uh, Mira Ginsburg, um, is it Mira? Uh, yes, Ginsburg, towards the end, does mention where that began. It began in 1918 when Gorky persuaded Lenin to let him start this publishing house called World Literature, Miravaya Literatura, uh, to bring into Russian the great works of the universal canon. Uh, through which he was able to employ a lot of translators who, because of their bourgeois backgrounds, might otherwise have been shot. Uh, one of them was a woman who also appears in this volume, the, um, uh, the Matahari of the East, um, uh, called Mura Budberg. Um, and she's there talking in this, but she was the Gorky secretary uh, in the setting up of the world literature. Um, enterprise and the the culture of translation into Russian um, uh, that was uh, launched with uh, that publishing house and then carried on by people like uh, Tchaikovsky <clears throat> um, is, is really rather different from the things that we normally talk about in uh, English and Western European languages and it still hasn't really been properly integrated um, and I suppose it won't be because it's now pretty much dead and all that activity and all that um, cultivation of translation uh, has disappeared. But just to put it in a nutshell, in the Soviet Union, <clears throat> it was absolutely normal for a writer to be a translator and for a translator to be a writer. The movement back and forth uh, was vastly more fluid. Um, there was no real separation or distinction between who was a translator and who was a writer. Or we could just think that translators are all writers <laughs> working with, um, you know, various forms of constraint that writing is this um, umbrella term and, and we're doing a certain kind for of us, For us, that is still a slogan and an aspiration with which I agree entirely. In the Soviet Union, it was actually a reality in the way people were paid and treated and so forth. No, it really is amazing. You know, this is something that we've been having back and forth about over email too, just thinking about the, the thoroughly Cold War setting of this conference that was taking place. And um, it's very difficult to think about our own historical moment now. <laughs> you know, I mean, we need another 50 years to think about what our moment is, what, what we would call it. Um, but, and just listening to some of the audio, um, there were sit-ins at Columbia that were keeping people from being able, some things were moved from this location to that location because people couldn't get into their offices or the spaces where they were supposed to be held. Um, and a different kind of sort of shutting out, I think, was happening than a sh the shutting in that's happening here. But uh, it has been really amazing to think about what the what this current. I mean, the fact that we're doing this, you know, <laughs> live streamed. Maybe there's someone in their living room watching. Maybe not. Uh, and that the difference between you know how how we can talk and connect and the kinds of uh, communities that we can form. In, in each of these moments. And then all of the effort that you put into forming the community that is then, you know, uh, made irrelevant by the fall of the Iron Curtain or, 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 so. Yep, yep. Time passes and things change, yeah. Um, one of the things that hasn't changed a great deal, and I don't know whether it ever will, uh, is one of the questions that was circulated on the, um, uh, the uh, the flyer for this whole series, uh, uh, for Esther's uh, translating the future series, of which genre get translated and which do not. Um, and I mean, you know, uh, uh, long fiction dominates. Dominated then in 1970, it dominates now. Don't you think? I mean, you're asking someone who translates from Greek also where the primary, the things that have historically been translated, even from modern Greek have been poetry mm. um, because that's been the prim primary genre or was the primary genre for quite some time. 
Um, and I guess I'm not, you know, I would have to be a publisher. I would have to have a bigger sort of uh, a publisher or a bookseller or a reviewer to have a, a better understanding or to have spent a lot more time with that translation database. <laughs> it's probably true. It's probably true. Uh, but it does mean, I mean, first of all, it has to be something that can be written and has to be something that can be produced and sold, right? I think that the the proliferation of online uh, um, places for people to be sharing work is changing this mm -hmm. and making it, and also what we count when we think about the translations that are like is is fan translations, subtitling, you know, all of those things that are happening all the time and in sort of arenas that we may not be paying attention to. Mm. Um, mm. Yes, I suppose it just shows what a an old fuddy-duddy I am, in, in, uh, obviously, you know, what can be counted are books, and so obviously when you count books, you find mm -hmm. that most translations take the form of book-length books. <laughs> um, True. You know, statistics can be very uh, misleading, and it is very difficult to get a grip on all the other modes of transmission that now exist, mm -hmm. as you say. Um, but it's true, some um, wonderful, ventures that were unimaginable in 1970 really have done something marvelous. Words Without Borders and others like it make short fiction, <coughs> which are almost unpublishable as such, uh, accessible to large communities of readers. And they're often the stepping stone to more substantial works and collections. Um, I mean, there used to be lots of newspapers and weekly magazines that would publish short stories, but they've almost disappeared at least as commercial ventures now. <clears throat> so the web-based um, magazines of translation um, are wonderful. And also poetry gets translated, not just from Greek, <clears throat> but also the, uh, there are web, web locations where poetry translation happens and happens very happily. Um, it also occurs to me that um, the um, proliferation of streaming services um, uh, for TV series and TV dramas and theatre has had a most curious effect because you can get them subtitled into a whole slew of languages such that Norwegian uh, um, um, the detective series can be viewed in Slovakia and Argentina and Australia uh, and that that is translation, and it's a most effective form of the creation of communities that are no longer bound by geography and no longer subject to the marketing rights of individual publishers, etc., <coughs> <coughs> or any particular TV station. So that um, obviously get a bit scared because it seems to be all out of hand. How are you going to count it? How are you going to log it? How are you going to survey it? Um, How are you going to sell it? Um, right. We started out talking about, um, yeah, money. But it's, but it, but it, but it really, it, it really. I mean, things are happening now in that involve language transfer and the movement of uh, cultural production around the world to places where it wasn't intended for. Uh, it, it much more intense than it was in 1970. Well, well at least we're now, you know, paying attention to it. I wonder. Um, do you, I, I, I sort of put forward an idea for what I would like to have. One tiny little thing that I would like to have more of. Um, is there something that you would like to see more of, David? Just what do you want? What do you want the next 50 years to look like? I want everybody to stop publishing books so I can catch up and read all those <laughs> I haven't read yet. <laughs> um, I wonder if we, you know, because soon I think we're going to be taking some questions. I, I thought we could end by reading the last few sentences of this manifesto that is um, published along with the papers for the conference. So I have it here. Translators are faced with a choice. Either they can continue to do nothing to improve their lot, or they can join together to ensure that at long last they will receive their due. The choice between apathy and active engagement in a struggle for recognition, between silence and the living voice. The world of translation is still largely undiscovered and unexplored. And the time has come to set the projects in order and to learn what can be done, what can and what cannot be done. And that is the end. 
it's it's really i mean yeah it it, it feels like it encapsulates this this feeling of everything is the same and nothing is the same <laughs> in some sense to bring that back Thank you so much, Karen and David, for, for ending on that note. It's just really the perfect place, I think, to, to leap into our questions. Um, uh, that was a fascinating conversation. I think we could keep talking or keep listening to you for, for quite a while. But, uh, but um, I want to make sure we do have enough time for our questions. And um, one of the first questions that came in was, do we need an updated translator's manifesto for 2020? And if so, what should be on it? And actually, I can answer this one because we uh, have a, uh, a team, a group from the translators committee, translation committee at PEN America, we have been working on updating the translator's manifesto and it's a fascinating project. And if anybody who's watching is interested, we are, we will be presenting a separate event on the manifesto mm -hmm. through in the coming weeks. So we will be addressing it um, in more detail. And um, if you're interested, you can contact the translation committee. If you go to pen.org, you can reach out to the translation committee and, uh, and get involved because I, I hope <laughs> at some point we, we get some back channel discussions of what it looks like to negotiate a manifesto, you know? Because I was thinking about the whole time reading this one, and then I'm I'm really curious about what that looks like. What that I want to be a fly on the wall in that room, yeah. or just a person in that room. <laughs> you can be. Um, I have a question that has come in on our our Gmail link that people can send questions to, which is translating the future 2020 at gmail.com. And it relates back to Rabassa's use of the word Google in that really haunting clip where we, we hear him talking. That's been one of the most amazing things about this wonderful conversation between the two of you that we've also included Gregory Rabassa and Isaac Vesheva Singer. We've heard them speak. Um, and I want to clarify that the word Google spelled G-O-O-G-O-L had been in existence as a mathematical term that was actually coined by a small child, sort of a charming story. But the book, uh, The World of Translation that resulted from these uh, audio tapes that by the way, you can explore on the Center for the Humanities website, the entire audio archive of the conference for all those who are listening can be explored and delved into on the Center for the Humanities website. So in the transcription in the book, Rabassa's word is spelled G-O-O-G-L-E, like the giant company. And without, without um, the capital. Without the capital, obviously. But it's the first time the word appears in that spelling uh, decades before the initial use of the term Google uh, that shows up in the OED. Um, so the question, the question, David, the question <laughs> is uh, Rabassa's mentioning of the term Google prompts the question of how you envision machine translation, such as Google Translate and others, playing a role in the future of translation. What opportunities and challenges does machine translation present as the technology improves? You want me to answer that? Yes. <laughs> <clears throat> My first point about Rabasta is that Google exists uh, quite independently of the uh, a software company uh, as a term from the English sport of cricket. <laughs> to bowl a googly is to bowl a ball that bounces sideways. Okay, so googly is uh, uh, something very sly. Um, that feels like entirely in keeping with translation. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so translation is uh, throwing, throwing googlies. Um, what is MT going to do? Well, what it already has done, I think, is make people much more aware of translation and translatability. I think it's provided a kind of a first taste of what um, uh, cross-language communication can be like to many millions of people. And I don't think it has deluded many of them into thinking that what they're getting is a proper translation. Um, so um, I think that it will improve the technology. It's go it, it, I, I think it's most interesting because it appears to solve what until not long ago were considered totally intractable philosophical, linguistic and um, uh, intellectual issues, like how you deduce meaning from an utterance. Um, uh, 
uh, and it does that to some degree with um, uh, remarkable solutions to quite deep problems. Um, it's not in any way going to invade or involve the field of literary translation. It might um, uh, speed up or perhaps even make redundant a small number of poor translators who spend their time translating repetitive and boring documents such as guarantee slips and terms of conditions in service, but that's really no great uh, uh, shakes. I don't personally think that it is going to reduce the need for translation in the proper sense uh, one bit, and I don't think that any of the engineers working on machine translation think that it will either. Anyway, I'm an optimist. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I have another. This one, well, this is about technology, but it's going to reflect back on, on the history. Uh, from the starting point of this live stream itself, please comment on the impact of the internet on literary translation and in particular, the role of social media in the increased visibility of the translator, especially translator as activist, i.e. name the translator, women in translation and more. Um, I don't know if either of you have um, thoughts on that or if you, in your experience over these decades. Do you want to take that or I mean, I, I feel like um, my career as a translator spans the shift of like tectonic plate shift of like being able to use the internet and not being able to use the internet for my translations and boy geez I wish that I had always been the post because it's so much easier to do research right. Uh, I made mistakes in my first book that I am very ashamed of and I would not have made it had there been an internet that was reliable in the place that I was living at the time. In terms of visibility, I think it's had a huge, I mean, again, like I didn't live in that world. So I don't know, you know, what it was like to, um, to circulate and try. I don't know what the communities were that were um, putting a conference like this together, for instance, and, and trying to fight for, for visibility and making these sort of uh, claims for things, right? But it seems to me that what I've witnessed in the past, you know, 20 years is the the just proliferation of um, uh, ability to to make one's work and to comment on one's work in in places that aren't you know if you don't have a translator's note you can write about it you can write about it on social media you can write about it on you know in blogs you can write about it in material that is then appearing in other kinds of ways so and women in translation all of these things start as like one person writes a thing and then it really takes on and it's good for booksellers and it's good for translators and it's good for women right um and i think it's yeah i think it's it's been an amazing force uh for good in that very specific kind of a way i don't know if anybody else wants to speak to that well i'm just glad to hear all of that because um I tend not 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 to spend too much time on the web in, in places like that because it takes too much time, uh, <laughs> so much of it. But uh, as it settles down into you know places to go, yeah, I agree. The web enables people both to create communities of uh, interested partners and to express themselves in ways that really are not available in older and more established kinds of media. So it's great. Um, we have another question that has come in from our cherished colleague, Susan Bernofsky of Columbia University. And uh, it's an intriguing question. What's the difference between a migrant and an emigre? And how is this difference relevant to our thinking about translation communities in the United States? So this is a really long conversation. Susan, if you're still there, let's go on and talk about this um, because this is a really, really long and complicated. I mean, all of the answers that anybody would give to that, to that question are political in nature, right? So the answer that I give may not be the answer that David gives. I think um, that it's all a matter of terminology and semantics and people, everybody is, multilingual people, plurilingual people and communities were translating all the time. Translators are people who translate, period. Um, and one of the things, uh, another, if we can make a wish list, <laughs> I would like to see um, more recognition of the, of the different kinds of translating that are happening. Um, and I think that interpreting and translation are not, you know, if we're thinking in terms of oral and written and whatever, like all of the different media that we're working in, we're all doing all of those things, right? And we have to um, 
give all of those activities the visibility and sort of uh, respect uh, that they deserve. And I think part of the impetus for, for activists in this field is to not separate um, the social and the political from the aesthetic in that way and to try and join them all together. I don't know, that's like a very short answer, but. Uh, I concur with that entirely. Um, I would just add that it, it's terribly complicated because there's also a historical dimension. Language is, uh, the vocabulary has, has changed over the century anyway. Um, and uh, the difference between emigrant and a migrant, it depends when you're asking as to what the answer is. But of course the answer is always social as well as political. But there is this historical shifting, shifting dimension of it as well. Uh, and basically the, the, the more terms of that, there's at least a dozen terms um, that uh, are, are very fluid in their applications and are, as it were, um, you know, it depends who's speaking or when and in which country. But I would just note that you know, even Charlie Chaplin telling the story of a poor migrant to the United States on film in the 1930s calls the movie not the immigrant, but the emigrant. And there's a, you know, a point of change in the English language. You wouldn't say that now to talk about migrants. So I'll stop there. Um, one, one interesting feature of this conversation, I think it's going to come up in a later uh, program in the series, uh, is the issue of mother tongue. Um, what is the translator's mother tongue? Which tongue? What is the concept of mother tongue? What about people who don't essentially have a mother tongue, um, who grow up in these multilingual uh, environments? And we are going to, uh, we are currently putting together a, a discussion about that that will be at one of the later events in this series. I'm getting so excited about all of these talks too, but I just, um, because even the ideology of the mother tongue, like what does that even mean to think about yeah, exactly. that this is a category of thought? All right, there's, well, there's, well, what, let's save that. The, <laughs> what does that even mean? Because I think that that's, we, we, we do have, we want to spend a considerable amount of time. And since we have yeah. three minutes left, uh, this is a somewhat long question, but, um, uh, from someone who has been uh, translating uh, the Senegalese journalist Annette Mbé Danville, who essentially kickstarted the feminist movement in Senegal, she says, and she's been thinking a lot about, uh, or I'm sorry, I don't know who's, who wrote this, but the, the Spiv, uh, Spivak's theory on translation, unless the translator has earned the right to become an intimate reader, she cannot surrender to the text, cannot respond to the special call of the text. So the, here's the question. What do you think of the quote in terms of in earning the right to translate? So I think this kind of reflects back on what we were just discussing. What does it look like for someone to earn the right to translate? And this person asking the question, especially for students like me who have studied the French language but have little experience in translation. And I... <clears throat> I think so. I, 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 I teach that text. <laughs> we just read it a few few months ago in my grad seminar. Um, and I think one, one thing that I'm really excited by is how all the questions are from 2020 and not from 1970, right? <laughs> and are positioning us in a conversation that I think we really want to be having right now. Uh, and I think Spivak is really thinking about language learning there and about the, the need um, to uh, language learning in its broadest sense, right? That you have to go in um, and that there's a sort of element of surrender to something that is not yours necessarily. And um, I mean, I have all kinds of very complicated <laughs> uh, feelings about thinking of translation as a right, like who has the right to do it? Uh, and I can't, I mean, I can't easily parse those, I don't think. Um, and I think it depends on who and what and where and, um, you know, sensitivities to the positionality of all kinds of, 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 uh, of translator and author and text and language. Um, that's not a satisfactory answer, I don't think, for if somebody actually wants an answer to the question. <laughs> Think, yeah, um, we are. I mean, I, I know that we could continue to have this conversation, but it seems like we are. I can looking at the clock. It's two twenty nine. So, um, I would just like to thank everyone who has participated 
in today's conversation and who made it happen. I'd like to thank uh, David Bellos and Karen Emmerich and my partner in my co-host, Esther Allen and Jamie Banks, who is a fellow who was working with us uh, to help produce this, as well as the group from the translation committee who is actively working on, on developing this. We'd like to thank our partners, PEN America, the Center for the Humanities at the Graduate Center CUNY, the Coleman Center for Scholars and Writers at the New York Public Library and the Martin E. Siegel Theater Center. And also I'd like to add that if you're a translator who has been financially impacted by this crisis, consider applying to Penn's Writers Emergency Fund. Information about this can be found on Penn.org. And one more thing, we did get a number of questions about the manifesto that we were citing and the volume that resulted from the conference. That volume is called The World of Translation. It includes the manifesto. Yes, there it is. And it was edited by none other than Gregory Rabassa, whose voice we had a chance to hear earlier. And if you enjoyed this uh, uh, one hour session, but perhaps missed parts of it, or you had a howling child in the background, things like that can happen when you're in your home, uh, please know that it has been recorded and it will be posted, the recording will be posted on both the HowlRound page and the Center for the Humanities site. So you'll find it there in a couple of days and you can share it around amongst your friends and let people know uh, to come next week for our next program, same time, same station. And thank you everyone for being here, especially David and Karen for that wonderful conversation.